some more people trickle in, which is fine, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, DHH is certainly a tough act to follow, but I'm going to do my best here. This is things I wish I knew before going remote. I know there are a lot of other awesome sessions going on right now, so I do appreciate you choosing to join me here today. So just want to introduce myself. My name is Marla Zashin. I use she pronouns. Um, and some of you may know me as Marla Brazel. I recently changed my last name. And in the words of one of the many government officials that I had to interact with as part of this, going from Brazel to Zashin was really a lateral move. And <laughs> I don't expect you to be able to pronounce either of those, so you're off the hook. Uh, just don't call me Maria, please. I live in Colorado, so my idea of fun may not be your idea of fun. Um, I like to backcountry ski in the wintertime and run in the summer. And when I'm not doing these things, I work for a company called Test Double. For those of you who aren't familiar, Test Double is a remote distributed consultancy dedicated to improving the way the world writes software. If this is something that you think, hmm, my company could use some help with this, um, come chat with me afterwards. And likewise, if you're thinking, hmm, I would like to do this all day instead of work for my company, also come talk to me afterwards because we are hiring too. So being fully remote and distributed, we actually have folks in 23 US states and Canadian provinces, um, which is pretty cool. We are all across North America. And much to Justin's disappointment, even though I'm not here today to plug Test Double, I am here to talk to you today about remote work. We'll talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and kind of all of the feelings that go along with that. And specifically, I'm going to tell you my story of going remote. It is your classic hero's journey, if you will. It has a buildup, and then of course it has a letdown. And then finally, there's this redemption at the end. And it has a heroine, that is me in this story. And given that it is a talk about remote work, we will start off by exploring how that arrangement actually came to be. And we'll talk about how at first, things were really great. I loved remote, and I was just thrilled that I could pull on a pair of leggings in the morning and not have to worry about whether I was dressed appropriately. And everything was awesome, but as they say, all good things must eventually come to an end at some point. And it's no different in this story either. So next, we will talk about how eventually I began to struggle with things, like not having left my house in a week, or not seeing many other people on a daily basis, and communication problems, and all of the challenges that can kind of accompany that. So for me, this eventually ended with a breaking point, and it forced me to get it together. And so the redemption arc in this story comes with finding balance and figuring out how to make the less glamorous parts of remote work into an opportunity to discover a little bit more about myself and my own needs. So without further ado, let's take it from the beginning. Our story today starts in 2016, where I took a job at an election tech company based out of Brooklyn, New York, and that company had a partial development team in Denver. That team shrunk over time a few people moved on to the next opportunity. A couple more people decided to leave Denver for reasons that honestly escaped me. But at the end, it was just me and one other person sharing a tiny WeWork office in downtown Denver. And I was also starting to work out of my home one to two days per week. Eventually, it was time for me to move on to my next opportunity. And so at the end of 2017, 
I joined Test Double, fully remote, and also the only person in the state of Colorado. So we've had a few others join us in the Denver area since then, but we all still work out of our respective homes, and occasionally we'll try to get together to catch up. And because I made that transition gradually from part-time remote to full-time, my attitude upon going full-time was basically, whoops, how hard can this be? I've already done this remote thing. It's not gonna be that hard, and you know, now I don't have to worry about all the things I hated about WeWork. And at first, it really wasn't actually that bad. I was in a honeymoon period of sorts, and I was loving that I was no longer bound by a lot of the constraints that I had working from an office. Like, for example, I no longer had to wait for the bus in the morning, and the bus in Denver is super unreliable, so this was really great. And I also got back all of the time that I had previously devoted to my commute. I no longer had to worry about packing a lunch in the morning and then leaving it on the counter as I ran for said bus. And I got to eat instead every day at the cheapest restaurant in the world, my own kitchen. I could even privately and comfortably manage some health issues without my coworkers being any the wiser. And for anyone else in here who also manages a chronic health condition, you know this by itself is really the holy grail, to not have to talk about it with anybody else and just deal with it yourself. I had this amazing flexibility to get life things done with little to no impact on my day. Before, if I had a contractor coming over to the house, I'd have to take off half a day of work to deal with them, and now I could let them in and be back at my desk in the time that it would take me just for a normal bathroom break. I won't lie, there is a lot of upside to working remotely, and that's part of why we're all here, right? I was finding that in many ways, a flexible work schedule really is all that it's cracked up to be. But of course, eventually, I start to get used to the shininess, it's not quite as shiny as it once was, and the lure of leggings wears off. And so I found myself at this point a little bit caught off guard as reality actually started to take hold. So I'm curious here, show of hands, how many of you have some kind of morning routine? Right, okay, just about everybody. Well, chances are it probably goes something like this. You wake up, maybe you get a little exercise or you hop straight in the shower. Then you make some breakfast or you get kids ready for their day, and then you're out the door as well shortly thereafter. Mine's pretty similar, except instead of putting shoes on at the end of the day, I throw on a pair of slippers and I head back upstairs to my office. And this is where I tend to stay once I get settled in. I'm guessing I might be a lot like a lot of you here, where once I get into the groove, I start coding and solving a problem, Time goes by and I've stayed there for most of the day. And because now I was now just going down the hall instead of out the door for a commute, I found that it was really easy for this to turn into being home for days on end. And because I no longer had to go outside to get to the place, from the place that I slept to the place that I worked, some interesting things were starting to happen. First, I found that work and home were beginning to blend together to the point where the distinction was no longer as clear as it should have been. And similarly, because there was no physical separation between work and the rest of my life, I was also finding that there wasn't really as much conceptual separation as there should be either. The temptation to grab my phone and check my email before I'd even sat up in bed or said good morning to my husband or get sucked into something shortly after waking was really high and something that I was not really able to resist. Likewise, because I didn't have an office to leave behind at the end of the day, I also was having trouble knowing when to cut it off. If you're a high achiever like me or dare I say, maybe an overachiever, you might even feel a little bit of guilt with leaving some work unfinished for the next day. After all, how hard is it really to refactor one more method or write one more test? 
And because there was no difference between my work environments and my not work or my life environments, time was starting to really slip by. And then one day I realized that I had no idea where my house keys were. And I was able to figure out that I had last seen them somewhere between Monday and Thursday. <laughs> but I wasn't really sure, like, more specifically than that, because much as I was loath to admit it, I also wasn't sure when I last left the house in a way that required me to actually lock the door. This development here was extra surprising to me because one touted benefit of remote work is that you should be able to work from anywhere. If you need a change of scenery, just pick up your stuff and hit the local coffee shop. No big deal. But sometimes my local coffee shop had sketchy Wi-Fi, and it also had that regular who liked to shout loudly about politics in the corner, and I needed to be on an important client call where I couldn't have that going on in the background. I was finding that even though I expected this you know, from time to time, these kinds of situations were actually cropping up a lot more frequently than I expected. And while work from anywhere is certainly a nice trope, in reality, I was finding that there were far fewer places that I could work that were conducive to the type of things that I needed to get done during the day. And because I felt limited in the places where I could effectively work, I also found that my interactions with other people were also becoming more limited. When I worked in an office or a co-working space, this wasn't an issue. I bumped into people all the time. I saw coworkers and friends in the hallway, and since my office was typically downtown and near my friends' offices, it was really easy to get together with people for lunch or make last minute plans to catch up after work. But because my office was now my home, I was finding that the friend and the coworker that I saw far and away most often was Pearl the dog. She's great. There was no getting around it. The social interaction that comes from working from home was starting to get really intense for me, or the social isolation, I should say. And that was getting extra intense, especially on the days where I wasn't pairing much or I didn't have a lot of other opportunity for collaboration with other people. And even though I was finding myself a little starved for social interaction, I was also feeling a lot of guilt over making some time for it. I found myself wondering if it was okay to get up from my desk and take time away from work for a few because this meant leaving my house. If you're like me, sometimes you can feel like you need to ask permission to do these kinds of things. And that is also nerve wracking because if you have to ask for something, it feels like there's a chance that maybe you're not supposed to have it. Theoretically, remote work is supposed to liberate people from needing to ask for permission to go about the minutiae in their day, of their day in a way that they choose, because it does away with this idea of butts and seats as a measure of output or productivity. And now, perhaps that's true, but I think in reality, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. We've all had days where we're not 100% on our game. Maybe you're fighting all day with Docker, and you don't get to writing any meaningful code until the last 90 minutes of your day, or maybe you just had a terrible night's sleep and you're not able to get into it for whatever reason. Well, when I worked in an office and I had days like these, like we all do, I still felt okay about the day because after all, I was still at work all day and people could see that my butt was in a chair doing something. But at home, I felt this immense guilt and anxiety on days like this when I didn't necessarily have the world to show for my efforts. I didn't know how to make it known either that I was still doing things of value and still being productive. And so that leads me to the last thing that I struggled with when I re went remote, and that's communication. Good communication is obviously important in every job. I think that's something that we actually talk about a lot at developers is how communication can aid us in our work. But it becomes extra critical when nobody can see you or your person. 
In fact, it's sometimes even easy to wonder, if you can't see me, do I even work here at all, or do I even exist in the world? And furthermore, because face-to-face -face interaction is often lacking in remote jobs, this means that good written communication suddenly becomes a lot more critical. The constant high volume, high quality communication that's required by a remote job is mentally taxing, even for those of us who don't have to practice at it a lot. And tired people eventually start to make mistakes. If you've ever had anything that you've written into Slack or an email be misinterpreted because maybe your wording was off and you didn't have the accompanying nonverbal communication to either clear the error or correct things, then you know how high the stakes can be in this sort of situation. So needless to say, I was starting to feel the pressure a bit, and between the lack of work-life balance, the social isolation, and the communication challenges, that honeymoon period that we talked about earlier, that had worn off. I hit a spot where I was really unhappy with my day-to-day to the point where others were starting to actually comment on my demeanor, and I was being asked far more often than felt appropriate if everything was actually okay. And you see, I knew in my gut that remote work had a lot to do with my growing unhappiness, but I wasn't really sure how I was supposed to feel about this. After all, remote work had been sold as this magic elixir, and that's something that I had bought into, that I was really nervous to admit that instead it was starting to turn into a poison pill. And that left me wondering, what was wrong with me? Given that my feelings didn't seem to match up at all with what I thought remote work was supposed to be like. I couldn't figure out at all how I was supposed to reconcile these feelings of loneliness and guilt and anxiety because whenever I would tell people that I worked remotely, it seemed like the responses were always ones of jealousy or longing. People would say things like, oh, I would love to be able to have that someday, you must be so happy, or I'm really jealous, you're living my dream. And so I started to wonder, if I was living somebody else's dream, and yet I was feeling this other way instead, well, maybe I just wasn't cut out for remote work. And so this spiraled for a little bit, and at a certain point, I finally got over myself a little bit and remembered that I'm fortunate enough to have some really empathetic, wonderful, understanding coworkers. And so I decided to confide in a few that I trusted the most. I told them about how I was feeling, and I was actually kind of surprised to hear their responses that a lot of them struggled with some of the same things. Okay, not what I expected, and also kind of interesting. So this got my wheels turning a little bit more. How was it that, for most of us, we could agree that this was actually the best job we'd ever had? We work on you know, difficult technical problems, we work with wonderful people, we're growing a lot, and yet at the same time, we're still struggling with varying degrees of anxiety over being by ourselves. And so at this point, I had the light bulb moment, if you will. What I realized at that point is that in all of my other jobs, there was a structure that was provided to me by the physical environment that gave me cues on how I was supposed to work. And while I'm the kind of person that's always known some superficial things about their work style, like how I like to take notes in meetings, or how I prefer for my desk to be set up, I had never evaluated work on a more deeper, fundamental level. And that's exactly what I needed to do. What I needed to do was examine the things that had previously been provided to me in a physical environment and assess what worked well from there, what I liked, and figure out how to bring that into my life now that I was in charge of setting up my own environment. This was a big epiphany, but as usually follows with epiphanies, the next more immediate question is, okay, well, what do I do now? <laughs> 
So let's revisit some of the things that I struggled with and see if we can answer that question. So if you recall, that first challenge of working remotely was when work and non-work life take place in the same space, how do you separate the two? For me, figuring out how to create strong, deliberate barriers between those was the key. So I actually created a dedicated physical workspace and forced strong boundaries around it. For me, I live in a house, so this was a room in my house that is now the office, and I work exclusively from there during the day, and when the workday is over, I shut the door and I don't go in. Now, obviously, not everybody lives in a house. So maybe this is a corner of your apartment, or it could even be a symbolic walk around the block at the beginning and end of your day just to symbolize the transition between work and everything else. The second challenge was similar, setting appropriate temporal boundaries around work, not starting too early and not ending too late. In other words, I needed to figure out how I create the non-physical barriers that were also required to create that work-life separation. For me, this means that every morning before work, I get dressed and I put on a little bit of makeup because this is what I would do if I was going out the door to a physical office. Now, obviously I'm not saying that everyone should start wearing lipstick, though I think that would be fun. But chances are you may hold yourself to some sort of expectation of presentation. I don't think anyone here would show up to their office in their underpants, so maybe that's not the way to dress for your job at home. I also know that if I worked in an office, I wouldn't roll in without brushing my teeth or having breakfast in the morning. I am a hangry person, as my pair can attest. Um, so I need to take care of these things at home too before I can get started on my work tasks. So for me, just having a habit or a routine that I can rely on, that's just as strong as a physical barrier. Now, Temporal challenges can be extra difficult when you're working across time zones. This is the distributed part of remote and distributed. And I realized that I needed to, instead of stretching the day to match my own, to match coworkers' availability, I needed to instead accept that part of the day was going to overlap with folks on either coast, and part of it just wasn't. So I communicated my availability pretty strongly to clients and coworkers, and also set a very aggressive do not disturb schedule on Slack so that I wouldn't be tempted to respond to things at inappropriate times. You might need to be as assertive in setting your own boundaries at home as you might in an off physical office. If your boss asked you to be in the office every day from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., you'd probably say sayonara and start looking for a new job. So this is an inappropriate expectation to hold yourself to at home just because your kitchen happens to be 20 feet away. Now the third challenge was around social isolation. Working from home meant that there were far fewer serendipitous encounters with other people. And while Pearl does give wonderful dog hugs, She's also not much of a conversationalist, and she's certainly not a replacement for other human beings. So I set a goal to have at least one event scheduled per week where I would get to interact with other human beings. Sometimes this was a meetup, other times it was scheduling a happy hour with friends, and yet other times it was just getting a manicure during lunch so that I could get out of the house and have some interaction. I also set this as a goal with my manager for a little bit of extra accountability. And to make sure I actually followed through, I did schedule these things. I would put my credit card down at the nail salon or I would make the reservation in my name so that I would actually have to show up. I would also be intentional about scheduling. I would try to schedule a happy hour near the coffee shop that actually did have the good Wi-Fi so that I could make it an afternoon out of the house interacting with more people. Now, to talk about the guilt side of this, I also had to tell myself that these are things that I would do on a lunch break or after work if I was working in an office, 
And so the only difference was that my office was now my house. It was still OK to go outside and do these things. I'm guessing that nobody here feels any guilt when a coworker grabs you and says, you know, hey, let's go run to Starbucks for 10 minutes. I know I certainly didn't. And there's also no requirement, despite our efforts to convince ourselves to the contrary, that we be chained to our desks all day when we're working from home. You're likely not going to be at your most productive anyways if that is the strategy you choose to approach. So taking breaks is not only acceptable, it's also healthy. So let's talk about that last challenge, communication. Without face-to-face -face interaction, communication with other people can be really difficult. I needed to find a way to get really good at both casual and formal communication with coworkers and my clients. On the casual side, one thing that helped a lot was setting up times for water cooler chat with other coworkers. This is something that Test Double actually endorses. We have something called Coffee Time, where every week you're randomly matched up through the computer um, with another person, and you schedule about 30 minutes to talk about whatever you'd like. I've talked about gardening, pets, programming, anything. It doesn't matter. But you can also do this yourself if your, co if your company doesn't have a formal structure. Just reach out to someone and see if you can chit chat at the beginning or the end of the day, maybe. This helps a lot. It helps not only with getting to know people, which is certainly nice, but you come to understand your coworkers' styles and how they communicate, and that in turn is super helpful when it comes time for more formal professional communication. There's this concept in communication of high bandwidth and low bandwidth communication. High bandwidth is maybe what you expect. It's when there are a lot of senses involved in communicating with somebody. Low bandwidth, on the other hand, is much more unidimensional. I realize that co-located environments have a lot of high bandwidth communication. That's kind of the default. We have a conversation with somebody, but we also get to see at the same time their gestures and their body language. We hear their intonation, maybe we hear them sigh, and we can figure out how they're feeling that day and maybe what it is that they're actually trying to tell us. Remote bandwidth, on the other hand, we don't have any of that. We see what somebody else types into Slack, and for the most part, you know, that's it. Maybe we get an emoji if we're lucky. So you have to transmit a lot more on low bandwidth communication because it's a lower frequency just to achieve the same means as if you were on a high bandwidth frequency instead. And so what this meant for me was that I had to change my habits to be more explicit and over communicate things that might simply be observable or taken for granted if I was in the same physical proximity as somebody else. This was everything from project status to what I was up to to even how I was feeling that day so that people could understand that I wasn't angry at them, it, you know, my stomach just hurt. More generally, I had to be a lot more thoughtful about my communication patterns so that everything I said had value and I was demonstrating the output and what I had to show for my day versus just relying on somebody to see me typing at my computer and assume that I was doing something worthwhile. Part of this renewed focus on communication also involved communicating issues to my employer. So I would be remiss if I didn't stop here at this point and mention that a lot of this has been possible because I've been lucky enough to collaborate with a wonderful manager and be at a company that does put remote first and puts due emphasis on making sure that folks are well supported. But what if you don't work in that kind of place? What if your workplace doesn't have a strong remote culture? Remote work is exploding in popularity recently, and that's you know, obviously part of the hook of this talk. And I'm guessing a good number of you are here today because you're pioneers in your company's remote journey. If your company is still finding the way and finding the way across the river, there are still some things you can do to make sure that you don't drown in the process. First of all, 
you may make sense to evaluate what kind of culture it is that you're actually working in. One thing that remote work does tend to expose is whether a culture prizes busyness or outcomes. Now, ideally, we should all prize outcomes. We get paid to produce things, not just hack away at our computers all day. But that's obviously not always the case. So if your workplace's culture maybe isn't that enlightened yet, you might have to work a little bit harder now to bridge that gap, over-communicate where you are and what you have to show for it. Now, I know that feels a little bit weird or uncomfortable sometimes to trumpet your own accomplishments, but relative isolation does require some degree of self-advocacy. And though it ought not to be the case, out of sight, out of mind is a real thing, especially if you don't yet have that strong remote culture, or maybe you're just one of a few remote employees. Secondly, you may want to make establishing your new remote work habits a part of whatever broader goal setting process you do have in place at work. You are setting goals, right? This allows you to hold yourself accountable and also allows you to build up a support structure around yourself if that happens to be a little bit lacking at work. It also allows you to demonstrate that remote work itself is also work and worthy of time and attention. Finally, don't be afraid to confide in other people. Remote work can often feel isolating, and these feelings can spiral out of control pretty quickly if we do manage to convince ourselves that we are truly alone. This is something that I regret not doing sooner. I do really regret holding my feelings in for so long because I think if I said something sooner, maybe things wouldn't have gone down quite as far as they did. Talking about it to a couple people really helped. Sharing with a trusted coworker or maybe a friend if you don't trust any of your coworkers um, can make you feel less alone. And other people are always great sources of advice and tips. So to recap, we've talked about several challenges of working from home. The lack of work-life balance in both the physical and conceptual senses the social isolation, and communication challenges. And we've also discussed some solutions to these things. Now, I'll interject here. These are just the main problems that I struggled with working remotely. Maybe you're experiencing some different things, or you hate that solution, or you have another one that's awesome to you. That's great. And throughout this talk, you may have noticed that none of these things really do exist in a vacuum. Remote work is a puzzle, and you can really rearrange these pieces to your liking until you find the solution that fits you. But all of these things do have something in common. They all entail a mindset shift pertaining to how we consider work. For me, this mindset shift entailed go going from relying on a structure that was implicitly provided to me by a work environment that somebody else set up, to defining myself the things that I needed and valued, and finding out how to provide them to myself now that I was in charge of my work environment. This, to me, is what's truly liberating about remote work. Because once you start to figure this part out, remote gives you the freedom to work on your own terms in a way that makes the most sense for you and whatever life circumstances you have. But we need to stop treating remote work like it's some kind of privilege to be earned by people or a gift that should be reserved for an organization's most senior developers. Doing so only focuses on the upsides of remote work and doesn't give any credence to the difficulties that people face in getting acclimated. It doesn't create a necessary culture of support around something that is inherently difficult, and that leads to inevitable negative feelings when people do hit those stumbling blocks. Instead, we need to acknowledge that remote work is a skill in and of itself, just like anything else at work. Nobody is born knowing how to do rails, for example, and nobody is born knowing how to work remotely. It's a skill that has to be learned over time and then practiced more and more to be refined. Because after all, 
there's no one right way to work remotely. And I think that's what draws a lot of us to remote anyways. However, because it's something that's deeply individual, it also requires work to figure out what your personal remote working tool set is. I don't think that this is something that I quite realized when I was getting started, was that figuring out how to work remotely is also work in and of itself. And while there's no getting around the fact that figuring out how to work remotely can be difficult, just because you're struggling with it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or you're a failure or that it's a foregone conclusion that remote work is never going to be for you. So if you take only one thing away from this talk and nothing else, I hope it's that if you're currently struggling with remote work, you're not alone, you can do it, and there is a path forward. Thanks.